<laughs> um, so this year, hopefully things have calmed down for everyone and everyone is, is weathering this well. So, okay, I have two o'clock on the dot. We're going to go ahead and get started because we have a lot to go through and we want to make sure that we go ahead and um, get through everything for you all today. So we'll do our best to adhere to that hour and a half. If you have to leave, don't worry, it's going to be recorded and you will get it is being recorded and you'll get that email um, sent to your um, whatever you registered at. So I am going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. Donna, can I just interrupt really quick? Um, one of the links I provided does have an agenda. So if you want to follow along, the agenda is listed on the blog post for register for this webinar. I can share it again, just so you have it and you will have all the details there. Okay. So this is the um, link that Kelly was referring to. So we've got the agenda right here. Uh, goes ahead and walks you through everything that we're gonna be covering today as we go. So let's go ahead and jump right in. We're gonna head straight into OPAC and public services. Um, before we actually get started, I do wanna remind everyone that this is a double upgrade. So it was really hard for us to choose what needed to be in the what's new. So what we did is we made sure we did extensive blog posts um, on the website for everything else that's not included in here. Um, so just make sure you go ahead and double check our websites too and we'll have all of that information there. But to start with, um, we have, move some of this stuff out of the way. Um, a fantastic new function, which is the holds history for patrons in the OPAC. So um, I'm logged in as my favorite patron. Just a second. Um, you'll see also that when you log in to the OPAC that your patron has um, new notices here on the right hand side, you have messages showing. So if your patron does have messages on their account, they'll see those immediately when they come into the system. So that's kind of a nice little functionality. But the thing that we're all waiting for is we want to take a look at our holds history. Now, Kelly just did um, a Monday Minutes with Jesse on the holds history. This is a new system preference called OPAC holds history. Um, it is off by default. Um, so, you know, again, as usual, we don't change the current behavior as much as possible. But what this will now have is patrons have a new tab in that holds history, and it will go ahead and show you the patron all of their holds. Um, it shows waiting, it shows canceled, it shows pending, all of those. So patrons can also go ahead and sort. So if I want to see when I placed items on hold and if I've gotten those yet, I do have my search filter here. So I can go ahead and take a look at those. Um, so like I can just say, you know, I know that there was something that had a word this thing in it, whatever it is. So patrons have the ability to go ahead and use these filters. They can also go ahead and print these out if they wanted to have a printout. So again, a nice functionality to go ahead and print those holds out for that patron if they want those, um, all of that sort of great stuff. So really cool to be able to see that. Yes, Kelly. <laughs> we had a question about a waiting hold. So if you wanna just show that waiting, there you go. And the status is in that far left. So yeah, so waiting means that that hold has been triggered um, and is on the hold shelf for the patron to come and pick up. Uh, we also have a question about what messages, um, the ones in the OPAC account or on the screen and the staff client that are at the top of the screen. Both. So this one is the OPAC note, which you know is the one that you have to go in and edit. That's the one that's a little more permanent. And then this one is a temporary message. Um, so that's the more temporary one, but you can, it'll show both of those, whatever you have in there. Okay. Uh, so Donna, that messages note on the front page, that wasn't new message that messages, that was total count of messages? That's all of your messages. Okay. Yeah, yeah, not just the new ones. Okay. Um, canceled holds. Typically, that means that that item, for whatever reason, um, did not get picked up. Um, and it's also if the patron canceled it themselves. So like these are all ones that I canceled as the patron. Um, so it's going to show both of those, Catherine. Um, 
that's something that really would be more in the staff side to be able to see like run a report to see when it was canceled things like that but this is really again just for the patrons to kind of see that perspective for that one um and again this is only for patron view staff cannot see this no matter what um so patrons you know are able to go ahead and keep this to themselves with staff cannot see this unless you've got the system preferences turned on um, but again even if a patron's not keeping their reading history, this will be kept for them if you choose to have that on there. Um, so go ahead and give that one a run through and see um, what's going on with that one. I hear you, Catherine, people just don't show up for their holds, do they? Um, so this will show them that they were canceled sometimes, but we have something really cool coming in a few minutes that I think is gonna help for that. So there's a little teaser for you. There's a system preference if you wanna charge them money when they don't pick it up. I mean, that's rough. <laughs> <laughs> it's always an option. Um, checkout history uh, pay, staff can only see if that is turned on in the system preferences for the staff client. So it's not, <laughs> I hear you, Catherine. Um, it's not <laughs> um, automatic. It is a preference that you can decide whether or not, first of all, reading history is kept for patrons. If it is kept for patrons, whether or not staff can see it. So we see a lot of libraries now that are opting to set the default to patrons not keeping the reading history, but patrons can opt in if they want to, but no matter the case, staff cannot see the reading history. It just makes that privacy a little bit cleaner, so. Okay. Um, let's see, uh, so. Uh, mm -hmm. Wally had one more question. But while I am afraid, I don't quite know what you mean. He asks, will there be a way to take those add a message messages off of those notices? So from perhaps, yeah, there's only, there's the messages, but that will, that count will just continue going up. Um, so yeah, that's I'm not sure where that other message would be. Oh, the ones in the edit screen, not the ones in the edit screen, but not. You mean from the staff client, Wally? Messages at the top. Okay, we'll, we'll um, touch base with you, Wally, and see exactly what that one is, because I think we're all confused with it. Donna, lots of excitement. Hold your horses. Lots of oh, no. Okay. One thing you talked about, does this eliminate the in-transit status for consortium libraries? No. Okay. Just want to be sure. Um, so will it show the reason for hold cancellation? Again, hold on. Um, no pun intended, because that is going to be discussed in a little bit. Yeah, that was really not intentional. Um, there is a system preference to allow staff to see reading history, not specifically hold history, Joe. Um, so in, this, in the staff client, it's rolled into one. You can either see the patron's checkout history and hold history or nothing. The OPAC is the only one that's had that broken out yet to, to separate that hold history. I would imagine though that I that that's going to happen in the staff client for too much longer anyways. Kelly? You can see the hold history in the staff client. If they're sharing their private their privacy is set to allow or your staff are allowed to see checkout history, that you can see hold history. Right, but you can't separate those out. You can't just see the hold history versus the circ history? Oh, you 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 can. That's what we keep talking about. There's so many changes that we have no idea what goes on sometimes. So we'll take a look. Into when we that. get the patrons, we'll see it. Don't worry. Um, and just want to uh, chime in with a quick reminder. When people are adding to the chat, if you could make sure that um, you are sending it to everyone, not just hosts and panelists, just to make sure that everyone is able to see the questions. Okay, so another new system preference, because what would be an upgrade without a ton of whole new system preferences? This one is called OPAC Hidden Items Hides Record. Um, so y'all know that when um, you've hidden all of the items off of a record, 
off of bid record, that record does not show by default in the OPAC. This now gives you the flexibility to decide to have that showing in the OPAC if you want. Um, so there may be situations where you do want that record to show. That is just a very simple system preference of either hide or don't hide. Again, by default, it is going to be set to hide because that is the system preference. Um, but you could go ahead and do that if you do need to. Okay. Um, back over to our patron record. So a couple of other things that y'all may or may not have seen in this one. Um, so you can see the notes. In your patron's holds information, if they are, if they did place a hold on a specific item, it will now tell them the spar code of the specific item that they placed a hold on. So that's going to be really handy that patrons will be able to see whether that's a bib level hold or an item level hold. Again, this is going to take a lot of education for your patrons to understand this, but that way you can go, they'll be able to see whether it's a specific item that they were looking for or not. Okay. All right. So that is the item level hold. The checkout tables controls. So in your checkout table now, you have the options to go ahead and use all your sorting and things like that. You can also print all of that sort of great stuff. You can also go ahead and use um, the searching if you've got a lot of items and you just want to look for something in particular. You can go ahead and use your search box to filter those out. So again, just some nice functionality in, uh, increases for the patrons. And then the last but not least one is if you are keeping search history for your patrons, they now do have the ability that they can go ahead and use the search and other functions in here. Um, so this can be kind of, so this is my example earlier where I couldn't spell almanac this morning. Um, so this is going to be kind of helpful for patrons if they are really involved in doing searches and trying to find things. Um, so perhaps I want to go ahead and, um, you know, just do a search to see if I look for this particular word or anything like that. Um, let me log out to, let me change accounts real quick to one that has a better search preference. Okay, um, so now I come over to my search history. I've got tons and tons of searches. If I want to kind of compare to see what has happened, I can go ahead and do SP. Well, I can see that I did a search for SPY on the 13th, where I found 329 results. And then on the 6th, I did one for SPYs, plural, where I only found 218. So again, I could go ahead and do that search again if I wanted to, compare results, all of those sorts of things. So just something um, added in there that you do have that search filter. Okay. All right, another exciting system preference that we have here is called reference not for loan donna can i interrupt briefly yeah absolutely uh shauna in the the chat asked um she was concerned we had not started when she thought we would uh we did start at 1 p.m central we just hit it running <laughs> we started at one on the dot and and have been chugging along so i'm sorry if uh, you if we were in the midst of things when you jumped in uh but yeah and that'll, that'll all be in the recording. You missed yay much, but it was packed. All right, um, let's see here. Reference not for loan status, again, a new system preference. Um, so you can now indicate if you have anything that has a not for loan status that you want to show as available. Um, so this is kind of a neat thing to show also. So this is gonna impact your patrons more than anything else. Um, so I'm going to spell it wrong again, World Almanac. So you can see that I had uh, not for loan values one and two in there. But now when I am looking at my OPAC results, I can see here that I have items available for loan, items available for reference. So that has my not for loan status is in there. So before it would tell you that that item was not available. Now it tells you that it is available for reference. So you can come into the library and use that. So again, just a little thing to kind of help, um, but it is a nice functionality that patrons will now be able to see um, that there are items available for, um, for reference use. Okay. Um, so, Catherine, this is the most exciting thing that you are going to want to know about. Um, there is a new script and a new notice that is a hold reminder. 
So Kelly and um, Jesse did a um, Monday Minutes on this. It adds a new, where is it? Oh, I guess we don't have it in here. Oh no. Up oh, there it is. It adds a new notice called hold reminder. You can go ahead and customize this notification and say, hey, you, your stuff is still waiting here for you. Come and get it. Um, so you can go ahead and customize that to whatever it is and include things like it's been here since last Tuesday. And if you don't get it by expiration date tomorrow, we're taking it away, whatever you want to do. Obviously, you're going to be nicer than that. This was sponsored by one of our partners, the Hotchkiss School. So everyone say thank you to the Hotchkiss School, because I know this is something that we've been asked for quite a lot to be able to do this one. OK, so this is great. Um, it does require a cron job, so you will need to go ahead and open a ticket if you're a Bywater partner, um, and you'll need to give us some information like what notice are you going to use, which branches, so it is limited by branch, you can do that one. Um, you can also say, do you want it sent by email, do you want it sent by um, SMS, do you want it to follow the patron messaging preferences for their hold notice already? Um, you can set it to run on a specific date and you're going to tell us how many days after that hold is waiting you want this notification to be sent out. So I am fully expecting a whole lot of tickets to have this set up because I think that's going to be a fantastic reminder for your patrons to say, hey, don't forget you need to come and get this one. So that was in our Monday Minutes on the 4th. Um, so if you haven't seen that one yet, take a look at it and then go ahead and let us know how we can set, help you with that one. Um, let's see here. Items available for reference. That is the system preference called reference, not for loan. That's what that one is going to be. Um, the hold reminder is not a separate messaging preference. It's going to follow whatever the patron is doing for the hold filled notice. It's kind of considered the same as that one. So, um, but there is a bug already in place to make hold reminder a messaging preference and it's already passed QA. So expect that soon. Awesome. Okay. Um, so again, I know that was really quick. Um, let's go ahead and pass it on now to who is next? Where is it? Is Andrew? All right. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we're going to swap real quick. And now it's Andrew's turn. Okay. And I'm going to come over here and I'm going to talk about some patrons and circulation stuff. Uh, so the first two things in my list, and I'm sorry, I just shuffled my stuff around. Okay, sorry, lost my Zoom chat. Uh, the first two things in my list are also both about holds and they're about canceling holds. Uh, so I'm gonna go, oh, let's go here. Two holds awaiting pickup. Got some holds waiting here, including this one. Hold on, hold on. Actually, that's not the one I want, sorry. I forgot which title I put which example on. Doop, doop. Okay, do you mind if I cancel? Where I can see, my cat, Nita, has a hold on this book. If I go to cancel this, I get a new pop-up that asks, what reason are you giving for this cancellation? Gives me a little drop-down from which I can pick the option I want. I'm gonna say, I prefer not to give you this book. And I'm gonna confirm that. That's done some exciting stuff. The bug title itself is just, let us specify a reason, but that has done some, some more things. If I jump back to my patron, her hold is gone, yeah, it's canceled. If I go down to her notices, she got herself an email, or she will shortly, to say, this hold has been canceled with the reason I prefer not to. So I've hit a bunch of stuff here. There's a lot of setup here. Uh, first, over in administration and authorized values. Oh, I prefer not to give you the book. Uh, Christopher asked what I prefer not to do. And that's what I prefer. Um, okay, so in my authorized values, if I look for hold cancellation, we've got a new category there, reasons why a hold might have been canceled. This is what makes your list of hold cancellation reasons. I've only got three, make up whatever you want, whatever seems useful to you. Um, like 
Other authorized values, we do have a description and a description OPAC option if you want to give different wording for these two based on whether it's the message you're showing to your uh, staff or the message you're showing to your patrons. So on upgrade, this authorized value category gets created. And then when you start canceling holds, you'll be given the option to apply a reason if reasons exist in your system. Okay, Andrew, two questions. One is, is this for staff to inform patrons of cancellations and not for patrons to cancel their own holds? It can go either way. So I canceled this from the holds page. I could also do that from my patron record. Actually here, it's just giving me a dropdown right from here. I could do that from holds to poll if I canceled my hold from here. I could give James Bond a notification. I can also do that over on the OPAC where I'm logged in as Nita. If I go to my account and my holds. Now I can't cancel this one because it's waiting. I could cancel it and that would record if I if it were not. Um, looping back to Rebecca's question from earlier about hold cancellation reasons and the holds history. They don't show here. And I haven't yet gone to see if there is a bug already on file for that, because we really should show that. OK. Um, can we set a default of no message? So like in that drop down, if I don't want to have to click something, can we set the blank as the default one unless I choose something else? I haven't played with that. Let me test it. I'll see what happens if we make a, an authorized value of blank. OK. Kelly's making, no face, and I don't know if that means she tested it or she just doesn't think it's going to work. I don't think it's going to work. But we'll, we'll, but we'll try. Yeah. We'll put that in our uh, let's see. Answers. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, another great question Will an expiration be automatically marked as a reason when that hold expires? That is the second bug in my list. Allow a cancellation reason to be spelled out in the cancel expired holds cron job. Um, so this book really, th that second one means nothing without the first. So just as right now I'm manually canceling these holds and manually picking a reason to cancel them, I can now set the cron job that automatically cancels expired holds to put a reason on there. So that could be the reason expired and they all get flagged as expired. And that's the notice that gets sent to the patron and also the reason that gets recorded in Koha. Um, um, and then a quick question from yeah. Sue. Um, about the authorized values and just in general sue authorized values can be limited by library so if you are in a consortium you can work with your consortium to have your reasons only show up on you for your library so you do have that ability to do that yes yes yeah if any of these were only used by one library we could limit it down okay so if we have those reasons in the authorized values we're given the opportunity to apply those as we cancel holds that gets recorded and is reportable, you, know, you could look at that statistically. The really exciting next part though happens if you've also set up a notice. So this will not happen automatically at upgrade. If you want this hold cancellation notice to go out, you're going to need to go to notices and slips and create a new notice. I should say you could also feel free to open a ticket for this, we'd be happy to help you. I did a blog post that walk, walks through all this setup and gives an example notice that you could just copy paste over into your system. But I made this hold cancellation notice that sends an email to say, dear so-and-so, your hold on this thing has been canceled and then puts the reason in there. We saw that over on Nita's account. I also put in a little added bit here to say if that reason was damaged specifically, we, we add a little note here that says, oh, maybe we're gonna order a replacement. And if we do, we'll put a hold on it for you. So if you need specific messaging based on which status you gave that item, this notice is pretty smart. It knows how to mix that up for you. And then let me just jump back to Nita here, back to her notices. I think this first one I did damaged. Yeah, this one I said, this was damaged. And therefore, it put in that extra note. So that's our hold cancellation. I have totally missed the chat. Cool. You're good. Uh, no. So that was the first two. 
Uh, my next thing is also about holds. It is make high holds work with different item types and number of open days. Oh, Danelle asked, it may be a good idea to do the same thing for items that are missing and ask if Patreon wants an IOL if available. Yeah, absolutely. You could make this notice say, if I canceled this hold because the item wasn't found, put in a line that says, do you want to try interlibrary loan? Reply here to let us know. Also, hello, Danelle. <laughs> Uh, Christopher asked for the YouTube link to this presentation. Okay, my next thing, make high holds work with different item types. This is a system preference that a good number of our partners are using, but not all. Uh, I'm gonna search high hold, decrease loan high holds. This system preference lets you limit the checkout period for very popular items. So as we've got it set up now, we say, if we have more than one hold over the number of holdable items on the record, so say we have three copies of this thing and we have four holds on the title, then it has triggered this reduction of loan period. We're gonna give you just three days for that item, for that checkout, instead of your normal period. This is a really helpful system preference, definitely for your very busy new stuff. You wanna kind of get them moving along a little faster. But the problem with that system preference has been that it's global. We have one place to set that and then it applies to all items. So in 2105, we're splitting that out. Now over in our circ rules, there's a new column, decreased loan period for high hold days, for high holds day. So this is not, I should, should have left that other one up here. One second. So notice this system preference makes a lot of choices. The, yeah, another column. Uh, it, the number of holds, exactly how it's figured, that doesn't change. But as we apply this, if a checkout triggers that rule, we can give it a different number of days. So maybe your books normally check out for three weeks and when they get tie holds, you lower them to two weeks. Whereas your DVDs normally check out for one week to begin with, when they get to that high hold status, you wanna lower them even further. So I'm gonna take my all all rule and make a copy of it. I'm going to make it apply just to youths and books. And I'm gonna say when youths check out books, they get a loan period of just two days. Save that. So, using books get two days, everything else is still following the system preference. So they get three days instead. If I go back to my patron and I remember my example uh, barcode. <laughs> She's getting two days for this book, even though any other item is gonna be three days. So a really nice little bit of specificity there, making this system preference a lot more usable. Uh, Amy had a question. What about customizing hold length based on item type? That would be cool. That's not a thing Koha knows how to do yet. I was just okay. mentioning back, I think there's some bugs about that. So we'll follow up on that, Amy, and yeah. let you know what exactly is in there. There's, there's several different competing ones. Um, so Danelle also asked, could you do this for an entire collection such as holiday books? And unfortunately, the answer is going to be no, because it has to be an item type in order to do this. So you could make your holiday books an item type and then be able to do it that way. Correct. Okay, my next thing is about uh, non-priority holds. Ooh, and Karen asked, can a loan period for an item type be a number of hours? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, well, let me jump back here. Do, 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 do. Yeah, we've just been dealing in days here, but any of your circ rules, if you change the unit here from days to hours, then it figures everything in hours. So your loan period is in hours, your fines assess hourly, your renewals are hourly. 
Oh, see, Kelly's already on it. <laughs> okay, uh, non-priority holds. I'm actually really excited about this one. Yeah, this is exciting. Um, I want, actually, I'm gonna go back to Nita here and her waiting hold. So this title is currently waiting for Nita to pick it up. I'm next in line after Nita with a non-priority hold, which is a new idea for concept, for, for Koha. So let me check this out. Shush. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I forgot what my error message was. I just made it go away and then come back. All right, I cannot renew this book because there are holds on it. We've got a bunch of holds over here, but I'm gonna cancel a couple. I'm gonna say, I don't want a reason, shish. And then at this point, I've only got one hold on my title. It's for me and it's a non-priority hold, which means too many windows. I go back to Nita's account, reload that page. I am now allowed to renew that item. Non-priority holds are a special kind of hold that stays in line, gets in order, but doesn't ever block renewals. So if you have a, an item that's checked out, you know tech services needs it when it's done so they can repair it, you can place a non-priority hold on that title for your you know, your tech services card, let the patron keep renewing it. And then you, then tech services gets it when it comes back. Uh, Rebecca asked, do non-priority holds count against the total holds allowed? And yes, they do. They are otherwise normal holds. They, they count all the same limits. Um, do, 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 and just to show you how to set one of those, they're quite easy. You do grab a patron and it's just a new little checkbox here, non-priority hold. If I set that when I make my hold, and it tells me right here that it is a non-priority hold. And notice that when I had that longer list, I had other patrons down the line who were not non-priority. At that point, it does block renewal because there is somebody yeah, down the list who shouldn't let you keep doing that. You got a lot of love for that one, Andrew. You got a lot yeah, of love. Nice little one. Mm -hmm. uh, Does the non-priority status show on the patron side? I haven't looked at that, Andrew. Have you? I don't believe it does, but let me log out and look at my own hold there. Oh, good. I remembered my password. <laughs> No, it does not show as non-priority here. And honestly, I don't think there's any assumption that your patrons are going to be placing non-priority holds. This was really imagined as something staff would be setting. And Rebecca wants to know, can you set the default for non-priority as a yes for a specific branch or patron type? Not now. That would probably be doable with jQuery to make that box be checked on the place a hold page. Um, it would be better addressed as an actual development to actually like teach it, teach Koha how to do it proper. And I agree with you, Christopher. I can only imagine we get enough questions about patrons from holds, uh, from patrons about holds anyways. If they start saying that they're a non-priority, yeah, that's not gonna go no, over well, so. <laughs> All right, next up in here is kind of an, an involved one. Add options to charge new or restore forgiven overdues when a lost item is returned. This one's my fault and I do apologize. <laughs> okay, several Kohas ago, you may, you may remember, we fixed a thing. There used to be a way to make it so when an overdue item becomes lost, as the patron is charged the lost fee, the overdue charge goes away. But then if the patron returns the lost item, the lost fee goes away and the overdue charge comes back. That used to be possible, but it was never intended to be possible. Nobody ever designed for that particularly. We kind of ended up there accidentally and then somebody fixed it. And I put the little air quotes on that because they thought they were fixing a thing and instead they accidentally took away a feature. 
So that feature is coming back officially. Let me come over here. Um, so this is going to be pretty niche, the setup for this. It may not apply to you. You really have to be charging late fines and charging replacement fees if when things go lost. And for giving the late fines when you charge the lost fee and for giving the lost fee if the item gets found. Huh? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is a fine point to say. Back again on that upgrades page, there is a link to a blog post specifically about this um, that really walks through all of this in more detail than I'm going to do right now. Amy says the fines module needs a complete overhaul. Any chance of that? I would encourage you to head over to Bugzilla and let them know what you think that complete overhaul should entail. Um, I know there is knowledge within the understanding within the community that the fines module could work better, but I don't know that there's a strong roadmap of what that looks like. Christopher, I'm going to show you a little bit more of the step by step, but yeah, the map is in the blog post. Okay, one, so more, here. one more question, Andrew. Processing, oh, sure. processing fee. Does oh, it? No, never. We're never forgiving the processing fee. Thank you, Donna. Donna put the, the blog post in the chat. All right, I'm gonna look up a couple system preferences, both of which start with win lost. For this to work, we wanna say win lost, charge replacement fee. Yes, do charge, that's pretty standard. Most of our libraries try to replacement fee when something goes lost. And then win lost, forgive fine do forgive the fines on an item when the item is marked as lost. Fines here means specifically overdue fines. Uh, Catherine's got a question. Add option to charge new or restore forgiven overdues when a lost item is returned. Would it also forgive the processing? Oh, no, no, it would not. Sorry, same question. <laughs> Okay, so let me go over to Magnus, the other cat, the one who's bad. He has an overdue item lost by James Patterson. He owes us $7 for it. I'm gonna take this, make it lost. And now Magnus doesn't owe us $7 anymore. He owes us $28. His $7 got forgiven, new charge got put on. That brings us to the part that's new here. Over in administration and then circ and fine rules. Scroll down a little bit. We have default lost item fee refund on return policy. This is not a new dropdown. It's existed for a long time, but it's got two new options. We used to only have either refund the lost item charge or leave the lost item charge. Now we have two new options. As we refund that lost item charge, we could either charge a new overdue or restore the old overdue. Um, I go into this more in that blog post, but Charge new means recalculate my overdue. Consider the day on which the item was marked found as the day on which the item was returned and calculate my fine based on that period. That means if I lose something and find it two years later on check-in, I get a late fee for an item that was two years late. If you're not charging a maximum overdue fine, like if you don't cap that fine somewhere, that could be quite large. Whereas on the other hand, if I just say restore the overdue fine, then it doesn't do any new calculations. It just goes back and looks to see what your late charge was at the point of the item going lost and reinstates it. A question from Lauren. She said, so if the library does not have late fees, will there be no charge assessed? Yeah, if you don't have late fees, this does not apply to you at all. Um, I suppose you could check either of these new new fine or restore fine, and they wouldn't do anything. But really, it wouldn't. It just doesn't make sense to pick them. Um, and Paige said, <laughs> perhaps just a slight electric current to gently remind them. 
And we don't have that yet. We can send them an email to remind them. I don't know how we make the email physically attack them. Sounds like a fun development. But I'm gonna take Magnus's book that he owes us some money for. And I'm going to check it in. And I get a whole bunch of messages. My item was lost, it was found, and we got a refund. Someone other than me is gonna to have to explain why it said this is new. Because I didn't set that up. Nope, and I really wanted to go back to Magnus's account to see that now he's back to owing us $7. My lost fee is gone. That $28 has been credited. And this, my original forgiveness for $7 has been voided, so my $7 is back. This is involved. Please do open up a ticket for help with it if you need any help. Um, and please, again, Donna linked that blog post that really walks through all the steps. And now from that, we're going to retreat to easier things. I've got two more bullet points and they're both simpler. First is a uh, issuer should be recorded and visible in patron circulation history. If I, oh, I don't think Magnus, Magnus is not saving his circ history. But Nita is, and if I look at her circ history, we now have a new column here, checked out by. Shows this checkout was performed by Bywater Support. Um, this is a easy set, uh, system preference. Do, do, do. Record staff user on checkout. Let's say record. Ta-da. Um, patrons don't get to see that over on their end. Uh, we can also see it in the item. Let's see, what did she have checked out? We look at the items checkout history. Oh, <laughs> I filed a bug for that. That's fixed. Okay, and then I've got one more, and that's multiple parts handling confirmation alert, sponsored by our friends at PTFS Europe and the Royal College of Music. Andrew, before you oh. move on, we have a question of, does it let you know which staff member checked it in as well? No, that's findable. That would be in your action logs, which staff member did the check-in, um, but it does not get recorded especially the same way this does. Okay. Uh, there's another question. Uh, is it checked out by retro or only for transactions going forward? Only for transactions going forward. Once you set that system preference to record, it will start writing those in at checkout. Who the person who did the checkout is also right now probably in your action logs. So again, if you really needed that, that data is probably existent, but this is going to make it a lot more easy to get to. All right, uh, last thing here, multiple parts handling confirmation alert. I'm going to check out an item. Boop. And this is giving me, please confirm checkout. Please concern the, the accompanying materials are present, da-da. And this does not let me do this checkout unless I say, yes, check out. It will do the same as I check this item back in. Boop, boop. Please confirm, check in. I'm going to say, yes. That's, I jump over to the item. That's the materials specified note in my item record. otherwise known as the place where you put a note to say there are 12 discs in this audiobook. Um, this is a really nice development for this system preference. Um, it, previously, this note would just get shown at check-in and had no way to actually stop the check-in process and like make staff go and confirm those items. So we now have a system preference that lets you set that to be instead of just informational, make it actually some, be something that requires a confirmation. 
So yeah. you mean, Andrew, that all of these libraries that ask us for help and I need to make sure I don't check this item in unless all 12 CDs are there, this is going to do that for us? It is going to really, really make your check-in process stop until they awesome. either check yes or no. If you're just autopiloting through your pile of books, the next thing you scan in won't go. It'll make angry little noises at you. That so, is, yeah. Uh, we have a question in the Q&A with the parts pop up. What does this do to RFID check-in? That is going to be very dependent on how your RFID is set up, which is pretty different library to library. I would guess it's not going to work well with RFID. Just thinking about how this works, I don't quite see how checking in multiple things at a go is going to play along with it. Okay. Um, uh, and Danelle um, asks, is this only added at cataloging or can it be added later to, depending on permissions? This is done at the item level. So anyone that has the ability to edit that item level, the, the, the three field, it will go ahead and do that. Um, you can add that in there. And then Wally says, will it truly not check in until you click yes? Correct. Yeah, it does not get checked in. Koha does not do anything with it until you say yes. So this is the system preference that turns that on. CERC confirm item parts. Here's the big thing about this though. This is global. This is applying to all of your items. If they have anything in that material specified note, it becomes something that pops up and blocks check-in. I know we have libraries who have put less dire notes in that material specified area, things that might seem less advisable if that's really gonna stop check-in. So think about that. This is only gonna be useful if every single material specified note in your system really is that important. There's some clear room for growth here to like maybe limit this by item type, but right now it's a global thing. But in the short term, Andrew, I'm sure we could write a report that says, show me all of my records that have something in this subfield free and I could go ahead and edit those from there. Yeah, yeah, you absolutely could. Um, Christopher said, it's too bad the note in this preference doesn't specifically mention that field. Yeah, um, you could file a bug to add some wording. My guess would be they made it, they left it flexible because like theoretically you could make your Koha work real different if you felt like it. Doesn't need to be the 952.3. I don't like to think about that level of hyper-local <laughs> customization. Let's forget <laughs> I said that. <laughs> All right, now I'm gonna like bop up and down briefly in case somebody's typing a question. Um, okay. You have a question. Can we add an audio alert for this? Oh, sure. Awesome. Um, yeah, I know. Um, so an audio, oh, that, that got mad at me because I pasted the wrong thing. Um, an audio alert can trigger off of anything that can be specified with a jQuery selector. So I know that cert confirmation thing can be a specific noise. I know we've got jQuery around to make it do that. I've even seen libraries that have made it so when they check something in and they get that message, it pops up really big and then it like jiggles around on the screen. So if you wanna make it very, very attention grabbing, we have that capability. And Donna shared a thing about setting up audio alerts. Yet another awesome min Monday Minutes. Mm -hmm. All right, I am going to stop sharing and I'm gonna let Sarah take it for technical services. I, I believe I'm first, Andrew. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's 2011 okay. first. <laughs> So I have half of the technical services section, and then I will pass it over to Sarah to do the rest of the technical services. The first item, I should have saved the best for last. However, I didn't. The first item that I'm going to talk about is the ability to create a profile when importing files through the stage mark records for import. So for all of you that get overwhelmed by the choices when you go to stage a file of records, you can now create a, a what Koha is calling a profile to save those choices. So we're gonna walk through creating a profile and also using a profile and you'll, you'll see a little bit more of behind the curtain. So when I go ahead and say stage mark records for import, 
regular goes, just grab that file off my desktop. I'm going to browse. Here is a new area called profile settings. This would allow me once I have something saved in a profile setting to pick that profile setting, thus picking the choices that I've already pre-selected for that profile. We are not going to use one of those prof profiles. We'll go ahead and create one so we can use it at a later date. I can see this very useful for libraries that when they get a Baker and Taylor set of records, they would use a specific set of rules, matching rules, mark modification templates, or if they get um, another set of files or eBooks, this would allow you to easily import records and not really have to think about it. Just remember the profile name you've created, which sometimes that's a challenge for me. So starting with your settings, you would make sure that the settings are correct for what you want to save for your profile, record type, encoding. This is important for those OCLC imports where their encoding could be a little different from all your other file imports. Maybe they use the MARC-8 versus the UTF-8. Whether or not you apply a MARC modification um, template to this specific profile, I don't want to use deletes, maybe 720 changes, who knows what that is. The next setting would be look for existing records. Do you with this profile want to look for matching records? And what are those settings looking like? So maybe this is a file for serials and you're checking on your um, serial ISSN and those matching rules that associate with that matching rule. Replace, don't replace, add. And then finally, check for embedded record data saying yes, check or no check and what those set selections are. What Koha is going to allow, allow you to do here is say, The settings that I'm creating right now as I import this one file, I can save that. And then next time I grab that same file or a new file from that same vendor or that same process I want to go through, I can then apply that profile. Wow. Wow. This is crazy. So let's go ahead and save that profile. So the next time I can go ahead and do it. Just going to go ahead and stay just for import. I'm not going to go further because I want to show you how you can use it the next time. So while at Stage and Kelly, we do have a question from Heather. Will mm -hmm. this also work with authorities? I, I don't see why not, Heather. We can certainly test it. If you're using the same choices in this same tool, I don't see why it wouldn't. Absolutely. The next time I go ahead and upload a new file, you can see I have that Kelly import. And that's going to default to the using the mark modification template 720 changes it's going to apply my record matching rule to check on that 022 so now i don't have to do much thinking i can just apply that profile i can add as many profiles as i want this is going to be everyone will see your profiles for your system and then you can go ahead and stage that for import People are loving this one, Kelly. I know it's it 100%. This is, oh, that's Donna. You're saying that 100%. This is going to make your imports more consistent. I know that sometimes people are doing somebody else's job. They're not comfortable. They forget what they pick each time. And this will really, really streamline this import process that you just grab your file, pick your profile, grab your file, just pick your profile. I, we can save a profile uh, for, specifically for uh, authorities. That is, that's one of the second. That is the second choice on that page, right under comments. Is are these bibs or authorities? Yep. And if you set that and then save the profile, it saves as a profile for authorities. Perfect. Perfect. Um, Catherine asks, these are just these are system wide, not just by user, and that is correct. It is mm -hmm. once they're in there, they're there for everyone to use, um, and then. Just a clarification, uh, Catherine, you say matching profiles blog post. Do you mean creating matching profiles for importing? No, there is a matching profile blog post already. Right. That's what I wanted to double check. She's asking about matching, creating those matching profiles or something else. OK, I'll go ahead and throw that into our link, into our chat. Yep. I just um, put that in the chat. So 
It's all perfect. Perfect. Yay! Teamwork! All right. Yeah, no, they are. Oh, everyone is loving this one. Oh, since everyone can see these, can one library edit another library's profile? You can't really edit those, can you? You have to like create a new one. Right, you do have the choice to remove a profile. I will have to see if that's a permission, but yeah, this is definitely something you could remove. Maybe if you are part of a multi-branch, you would wanna make sure you're putting like your branch code in the beginning to apply it. I'll be definitely, I'll, I'll make a note of us to check into that one. And just for all those new users to Koha, maybe this is your first upgrade webinar for those questions that we can't answer. Or for example, Donna talked about a report to show you all your subfield threes. We will provide questions and answers from our upgrade webinars. So you will have a resource to go back to later. You all ask very great questions that some Sometimes we don't think of those. So this gives us an opportunity to dig into it some more. Okay, my next one, not as exciting, but super helpful. Um, this is a new system preference that allows you to add unwanted fields to your purchase suggestion form. Oh, I can remember, oh, so long ago we, Koha added quantity to a purchase suggestion form. And there was all the uprage of how dare people want to add five of those. And we had to do fierce jQuery to make sure that um, that was hidden for those libraries that did not want that. So now, ta-da, Koha has given you the options to pick and choose what fields are mandatory, which has always been there, and what fields are unwanted. So you could go ahead and hide those fields, such as quantity, such as author, if you wanted. So if I go to the new system preference, OPAC suggestion, unwanted fields, I have this drop down menu that allows me to pick and choose which ones I want to have not show. So I have publication place, public publisher name, and I can hide the quantity. Once I save those, refresh my purchase suggestion form, I now don't have quantity, publisher, publisher date. So this is mo way more customization that allows libraries to do. And we are not gonna talk about all the purchase suggestion changes, but there's a few more little hidden gems um, that you will find once you start digging around in our upgrade notes. But again, this is a new system preference that would allow libraries to pick and choose what fields are unwanted, hidden um, in the form. And I'm sure everyone has seen the Monday Minutes also that shows all of the different sections where this same sort of change has been made in Koha. Yes. So there's a lot of places now where you have those check boxes or checkity boxes as we call them instead of having to remember your codes. Checkity uh, boxes. Speaking of, Carly asked, could those unwanted suggestions be in the patron creation as well? Do you mean, could we have an option to hide fields from the patron record? Like to say, I don't want to see, I don't want you to ask me for their phone number or their aunt's birthday. Ta -da! Yeah. That already exists. Yeah. We have created that for you right now. <laughs> and actually, they're getting a lot more easy to use in 2105, which is cool. Yeah. So borrow or unwanted fields. We're continuing saying that same word, unwanted. So if you're like me, just remember that one word and you'll find all the unwanted system preferences. And you can click here and then you can pick and choose which fields you do not want in the patron form ever. And then there's a comparable one for patron self-registration and patron self-modification if you're letting patrons do that stuff over on the OPEC. Yep, another unwanted, another unwanted. <laughs> All the unwanted. This yeah, and I love the change to checkboxes here. These used to require you to type all those field names manually and it stunk. Yeah. Remember though, you did create a great document, Don Andrew, for us to use. So I would rather not need a tool. <laughs> I know, I know. Okay, my last one for those multi-branch 
libraries, this is going to be a dream come true. We're still in our purchase suggestions, but we have um, created our purchase suggestion options at the bottom to indicate number of suggestions per library and per total library. So the bug is called counts of suggestions are confusing. So we used to have libraries that say, it says I have seven that are appending, but I see none because it was then created by branch. And if you were not logged in at that branch, you would not see the pending suggestions. Now a library can see, I am logged in, if you can see that up here at the top, I'm logged in at the East branch. So I can see that the East branch has one pending suggestion and the total number, all my libraries combined have seven. So if I click that one, I will easily go right to my specific branch and I don't need to use the filter on the side for this specific um, goal in mind, but I still have those filters that I could alter. You also have the ability to view all the others or look at other branches right from here instead of again using the filter. So this hopefully will alleviate libraries with their missing pending suggestions or thinking they're missing out on something or truly letting Koha tell them what specific purchase suggestions they are responsible for instead of showing them a big number where they're not responsible for all of those. So this is fantastic and we're super excited. I'm getting lots of claps. Yeah, people love this. Anything that makes it easier and clearer, I think is great. And I know I've already had uh, partners, early adopters that say, hey, can we do this with patron comments and patrons modifications and other things? So one of the things I do love about this is it lays the groundwork for us to be able to it, enhance Koha even more to kind of make that functionality available in different areas, so. And, and that's what, these upgrades show us is that with each upgrade, we are able to customize it more and more because of the, the voices of the librarians using it to say, wouldn't it be great? And we have had already quite a few suggestions on how to improve current enhancements or past enhancements through this chat already. So you know we're going to see more as we go on. Um, All right, now we're turning it over to Sarah. Uh, who's going to finish the technical services for the 2105 portion. Yes. All right. So we are actually going to continue with some purchase suggestion changes. Um, this is another thing that used to be handled uh, by jQuery. Um, so we have here on the OPAC our purchase suggestion form. Um, I should refresh it to update the fields that Kelly just selected to hide. Is there uh, not showing your screen? Oh, so sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I thought you were just building up suspense for a while. <laughs> That's fun too. All right. Here we go. Perfect. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is the OPAC purchase suggestion screen. Um, again, with the fields that uh, Kelly just hid. Uh, so we've only got these showing. So in the past, if you wanted to update what was here, um, that was something that needed to be done by jQuery. Um, libraries could not update that themselves. But now um, that is something that can be done through the news tool. Um, so that is something that either you can go ahead and update if you're comfortable or submit a ticket, but either way, it's much more uh, customizable than it was uh, faster to customize than it was previously. Um, so to get there, you would uh, start in tools and then click right here in news. And um, just quickly point out one other thing um, that's new is that um, expired news items are now hidden, hidden by default. So if you know that there are some that are expired but aren't showing up, there's a little filter there to show those. but. Um, as far as this enhancement, um, if I wanted to update the text on that screen, I would start a new entry. And it's going to be the OPAC suggestion instructions um, for the display location. Um, this either can apply to all libraries or there is a system preference um, called OPAC News Library Select, where you can select to have it 
um, only apply to specific libraries. Um, but for us, we're going to have it apply to all libraries. And then just like any other um, news item, you will add your title. I'm going to publish this today. Um, and since I want it to be ongoing, it's not going to expire. Um, and I'm going to get my text in there and then I copy and paste this. And this is nice also because you can customize the, um, you can bold things, you can make them larger, you can use HTML if you wish to do it that way. Um, but I'm just going to use the simple editor and want to make this the header. So I'm going to do heading one. I want it to be this color. Um, you can also insert links, which is nice. Um, if I want to, for instance, have a link to the collection development policy or to something like interlibrary loan um, request page, um, you can just um, highlight where you want the link to go, click the link button, go ahead and paste it in there, and you can open it in a new window even if you want to. Um, go ahead and submit. So it's now going to show up here. I can preview the content if I would like to. Um, and now if I go back to my purchase suggestion page and refresh, you can see that we have the new text. Um, so it's got the, the title, um, the text that was there, and again, the, the fields that Kelly um, had chosen. And the other really nice thing about this is that if you then decide that you do not want this there for any reason, um, you can, of course, edit it just like you can with any other news item. Um, but if you delete it, it goes back to the default. So you're always going to have something there, even if you decide that um, what you had custom uh, inserted is not what you want anymore. All right, just taking a look at. Okay. Uh, we had a question, Laura, um, and then we got off topic because it's me and we had sparkling unicorn land and you know where I would go Fair with enough. that. But anyways, um, Laura has a question. This is what about message changes by group? I'm not sure what you mean, Laura. Can you give me a, a little bit more on that one? We'll have to figure that out. Like updating those news items for multiple locations, perhaps? Okay, I'll keep watch on the chat. Sarah, go ahead. Okay. Um, all right, so next up we have setting a custom order uh, or a default sequence for subfields in cataloging and um, item records. And okay, um, so yes, this uh, allows you to create a custom order for your um, subfields in the records for items and authorities. Um, this uh, you can now create frameworks depending on if you know there are always certain orders that you like to fill things in or um, certain fields that you want to be at the top for whatever reason. This will allow you to do that. So. Uh, again, we're going to start uh, from the home page and go to administration. We're going to go to our frameworks. Um, you can do this in whichever frameworks you want. Uh, for this, we're going to go with the default framework. Um, and for this example, um, I am not a cataloger, so pardon anything blasphemous that I say at any point, but uh, you can search for the tag that you know you want to rearrange. And then you'll go here to the actions, caret, and to edit subfields. Um, and so now we have always had these tabs, but the nice thing is that now you can drag and drop them so that the fields that you want to appear first when you are creating um, a new record will appear in that order. So it's a really simple drag and drop process, grab it, Move it on over. That one. I want you. 
And then you. Okay. All right. So we've got those in that order there. We're going to save the changes. I'm going to do the same thing for items. So let's say, for instance, if we are manually scanning barcodes in, we want that up at the front. We know that we've got lots of notes that we need to add in. I'm going to move my head. I, I'm, I'm with Heather. Oh, be still my heart. I'm, I'm losing it. it yep. as, I, I think it would be crazy. My eyes have gotten used to seeing them in a certain order. Yeah, it, it takes some getting used to. And I will say also this. Um, dragging the tabs when it, they have to be on two lines because of your screen size sometimes it gets a little finicky with wanting to place it in the right order so you might need to if you have a larger screen available to stretch it out um if that starts giving you any trouble that has worked for me to get them where they need to be um we also have a question from amy of will the reordering of the subfields carry over to the opac so what will they show like when the patrons are looking at them so it's not going for bib records it does not apply to existing records um so we can create we're going to create a test new one and see how it shows there um we will find out um it does show for existing item records but of course patrons aren't going to see that information anyway so we will check on it all right so I'm going to save that. All right, so uh, one thing to say with this, um, it does not apply to records brought in via Z3950 or imports, um, at least in the, the testing that I have done. Um, so this is more going to be for any original cataloging that you do. Uh, but again, for the item records, the uh, change in order will apply for existing and new items. All right, so if I go to create a record with the new default framework, I'm gonna click these in just so it will save. Okay, so you can see now for the, um, this tag, our subfields are in the order that we um, place them in the uh, default framework. Now, once there is information in any of these um, subfields, anything with data will be saved at the top next time you reopen it, um, but otherwise they should be in this order. All right, so going to get something in there for now. Oops. Ah, this is a bug that I was have that I need to look into. I was changing some orders around, and it was messing around with what um, became mandatory. So I'm just going to leave that there for now. Um, all right. So and then I know what I've got. Okay. It was. Oh, of course. Mary asked a good question. Yes. Is this going to change the order of existing records that use that template? It will not. So anything that is existing with that template um, will be in the order that it was when it was created. You can um, drag and drop the subfields in existing records, and those should save in the new order. Um, it was not being consistent with me with dragging and dropping subfields that did not have information in them, but those with information should save in the order that you drag and drop them into. Oh, goodness, 650, of course, sorry. Just gonna get to now. All right, and so, So now also you can see when I go to add an item, we've got the um, 
barcode, non-public note, and public note are at the top. Um, and so similarly, if I go to a record that um, already existed, I'm gonna refresh just since made some changes since then. If I were to go here to look at, just to show you um, the record. So this one doesn't really show super well anyway, because this had information in the top, in the, um, in one of the ones that we had moved. Um, but again, in the testing, it was not um, outside of things that had information. It was not consistently saving them in the order without having to rearrange them manually. Um, but if I go to look at an item that already existed, you can see here, it again moves the barcode um, up to the top. Um, so um, for existing records, it is shifting the item. For existing, existing items, it is moving the fields um, in the order that we set them in the template. Um, and you can do the same thing with authority records. For time's sake, I'm not going to demonstrate that, but it is the same process. Um, and it should, that one um, should apply to existing records and new records. Um, all right. Are there any other questions coming up about this one? No. Okay. Several questions about how that's all going to work. Um, so we're going to need to go ahead and take a look a, a little bit more too, because we're coming up with different examples. And Amy mm -hmm. has discovered that the table comp columns aren't changing. So we need to double check some of those too. Um, so we're definitely going to be spending some more time looking at this one. Um, and Heather wants to know, is there any way to put the subfields of authority records into a default order? I have no idea what you're asking, Heather, because I'm not a cat. No. Um, this should... You should be able to, right? You can yep, set yeah, it up should do the same thing for authority subfield. Yeah, yep. Yeah. If you are going into your authorities and rearranging um, the defaults there, uh, because if you here, the only thing I would say, Heather, as you know, is that sometimes changes don't work the way we expect them to. Um, so if you have done that and changed it, and it's not importing the way that you thought, or it's not arranging it the way that you thought, definitely let us know um, and we'll get our, our devs looking and take a, taking a look at that and seeing what's going to go on. Um, Jane is asking if we import the 952 field with subfields in a specific order, will they still go into this proper subfields or will they be saved out of order? And do we need to worry about this as a source of new errors? Um, and Jane, no, it's going to always look for like that subfield. So it's going to look for the that mark to Koha mapping. No, Koha to mark mapping um, to get that set the right way. So don't worry about that. You can focus on other errors that are going to come in. <laughs> um, all right. So the final one that I've got is um, something that is covered in a Monday Minutes. So I'm not going to. Um, go into a ton of detail and it is relatively self-explanatory, but it is uh, for inventory. Um, you can now select item type. Item type is now one of the filters that you can use when you're bringing up your inventory. So again, we're gonna go to tools and then into inventory. Um, so this is useful if you're doing the shelf list version of inventory. Um, if you want Koha to generate a list of everything that is expected on the shelf, and then you bring that list to the shelf to see if it's there. Um, so what I can do here, for instance, um, I want to say that I want to look at everything that currently at the main library um, is in the adult section, but has the item type audiobook. Um, so I guess it really depends on how you have things structured in Koha. Sometimes the shelving location is specific enough that that will narrow things down if you use it with call numbers. Other times, just the combination of adult and item type will bring you exactly what you need um, to uh, bring up your inventory list. So if we have those selected, of course, I'm going to skip items on the whole shelf and that are out. And then this will again bring me all of my audiobooks in the adult section. Um, so it can just be a really uh, another really useful tool for bringing up an inventory list. Um, just another option 
for sorting that depending on um, what your process is for uh, doing inventory. Um, but again, that is covered in uh, Monday Minutes. So there's not, I'm not gonna go into a whole lot more details since we've got a few more things to cover. Um, it's so coming, it's, it's Sarah, it's coming in Monday Minutes. It has not come Oh, it's out. coming in Monday Minutes. Oh, okay, sorry, oh, I had the wrong date for hold that. Your, no, it, we, we okay. postponed this one for something else. So uh, it is okay. coming, we promise. Okay. Um, all right. So with that, I'm going to stop my share and pass this. Um, I'm going to jump right in. So I have 10 minutes to get through this and give you all a few minutes for questions at the end also. So we can do this. Um, there's only three little things here in administration. The first one is going to be one that I am going to really struggle with, and that is naming. Um, you know, COHA has been going through, the community has been going through and trying to be consistent with naming and things like that. And so it's been a struggle sometimes. Decision has been made. The the staff view, the staff interface, the, the staff client, the back end, whatever we've been referring to, what we're looking at now is now going to be called the staff interface. So we're going to make that language consistent throughout what we're doing. And I can guarantee I'll be calling it the staff client, the staff view, um, until we all get used to that one. So just kind of be aware of that. We're going to, we're trying to get our, our verbiage consistent. So this is now the staff interface. Acquisitions, there's a great new functionality in the um, orders by fund report. So over here on the left-hand side of my acquisitions homepage, I have my orders by fund. And I now have the ability to go ahead and do um, some of these same table settings that we've seen in other places. So I can go ahead and configure those. I can go ahead and choose which columns I'm seeing. I can go ahead and export or print all of those great sorts of things. I can go ahead and sort by basket number if I want all of those great things. So it gives you a, a great opportunity to kind of make this report a little bit more useful to you. You can also use that search to filter things down um, however you want to. So again, just some great things to think about when you're doing your acquisitions reports. This last one is something that we've had some struggles with over the last few releases. Um, and it's something that is an ongoing issue um, with trying to figure out how it needs to work for everybody. And this is when people um, have the ability to allow the hold policy override and they place a hold on the patron's behalf, it doesn't always go as expected. So what we've done now is we've added a little bit of extra kind of help you understand if you are placing a hold that is violating a policy. So um, right now, the drop down for pickup library for existing holds only shows those libraries allowed by circulation rules. Before you could set, you could choose any library. Um, now, if I try to place a hold on this item, we're gonna pick up right here. Um, James wants this. If I go ahead and try to pick this up at the bookmobile, I'll see that I have that exclamation point. So it's a small little thing, um, but it does go ahead and do a mouse over and says this pickup location is not allowed according to circulation rules. So it at least tells staff you can place this hold, but it's not going to work the way that you expect to and your patron may not get it. Um, I know, I'm sorry, y'all, James Bond number is not 007. I didn't get that far ahead. Um, but this is really helpful. So not only here in that uh, general hold one, but also in your individual ones. Um, and so, for instance, you can see the copy at Sparkly Unicorn Land does not have any allowed pickup locations. Um, so it's not defaulting to any of those. But we do have, again, that exclamation point that is going to show you um, that you're doing something that's violating your whole policy. So this is the first step in a number of improvements that we're going to see coming that's going to help make this whole holds allowed, pickup allowed, circulation allowed um, mess a little bit easier to manage. So this is the first step. I love it because that way patron, their staff will know immediately what I'm violating when I'm doing that whole, when I'm doing that policy. So, all right. That was the end of all of our upgrades. So we have six minutes um, that we can answer any questions that y'all have for us. Um, and just remember also that we do have another session on Friday. Um, 
that if you want to repeat, it's going to be exactly the same content, so you don't need to come. Um, but if some of your colleagues weren't able to make it, we do have another session on Friday. And then in two weeks, on Tuesday the 26th and Thursday the 28th, we'll have the Q&A sessions. And those will actually be times that you can talk um, and ask questions and we can walk through things together um, and, you know, play all those sorts of things. If you don't realize it, our test site, our demo site is up on 2105. So you can go ahead and head over to our, tests, our demo site and explore there and try all of these things out in 2105. All right, y'all hit us with questions. What do we got? While folks are typing questions back on that agenda, the second page of the agenda includes a list of features, other features that were sponsored by our partners. So please have a look there. There are a bunch of cool stuff. I, I can't remember if it was Sarah or Donna who said at the beginning that we, we definitely pared down what we talked about here. There are a lot of other cool things in this release that didn't quite make the cut including a bunch of cool things that were sponsored by our partners. So thanks to everybody who sponsored some developments. Thanks for helping to make Koha better and cooler. And I neglected to mention that the ones that I, we're very excited about, the whole history for patrons in OPAC, was sponsored by Knuckles, the Northeast Kansas Library System. So that was a, a great enhancement for that one. So, um, let's see, we can go ahead and put that um, so Stacy was looking for the link to the agenda. I went ahead and just gave you the shortcut there for that one. But that all of this information is linked off of our upgrade webinar webinars page, which is here. Um, and then again, we will. Stacy, Google should let you download and print that. Fine. Let us know if it doesn't for some reason. So, but all of this uh, this page is going to include the agendas. It's going to include uh, the links to the recordings once we have those up. Um, and then it also has all of our other information as far as our blog posts and things like that. So lots and lots more information coming. We've gotten our overall uh, blog posts done so for the main topics, but we are going to be working individually on some very specific features that we really want to highlight a little bit more. So lots of great things coming. And for all of you that are early adopters out there, thank you so much. Uh, Rhonda in particular at Round Rock. Um, if you are out there, thank you. She found two bugs um, on Monday. Um, so we've got those files ready to go. So those early adopters are really helpful. Uh, we will be posting the chat also. Um, we'll go ahead and edit it out so you don't see the stuff about the unicorn wands and things like that. But we'll go ahead and get that chat posted so that you can see all the questions and answers. All right, well, we'll hang around for a few more minutes. Y'all are welcome to head on out and enjoy your day. We appreciate y'all coming in. Does anyone know of a bug that's going to display um, in the inventory, the serial enumeration? Has anyone heard of that? No. Okay, I'll look around. I'm going to stop the recording. Perfect. It's official peanut M&Ms have won. Awesome. Peanut butter or peanut peanut? Peanut. Peanut. Yep. Oh, wait, there was a question. Uh, so Christopher is asking, is it true that bootstrap, bootstrap is changed and yes. IDs are majorly changed, especially for the OPAC? I'm going to say yes. I have no idea, though. Bootstrap Betty. is changing to five, I want to say, versus four. Yep, and I know Lucas has been working on updating uh, the Galadriel plugin and, and the various tools he uses. I have not spoken to him about how much he expects you know, any given piece of jQuery out in the world to need to be changed. My hope is he would have been yelling at it, about it a lot more if that were the case. But, but yes, with sure. Eric saying that he did have a lot of things that needed to get fixed, uh, do let us know. I mean. That, that's a thing Lucas has been looking at and working on to be prepared for whatever changes come up. Um, and Bob asked, is the auto renewal digest set by switching which message is sent by the cron? Um, yes, it's actually become a system preference that you can go ahead and choose which how it's sent. So that is a system preference now. Um, and Eric is saying, if you're using the bootstrap selections in your JS, they'll need to be updated. In some places, you can only use layout selectors to grab certain parts of the page. I'm sure that all makes sense to people, but <laughs> not me. <laughs> All 
All right, I don't see any typing happening. So I think we're good. Thank you all so much. Hope to see you in two weeks at the Q&A. Bye all.